subsurface and the design of the injection systems themselves. So on that, like I'm pretty excited to, to get this underway. We've been waiting for this for quite some time. And, uh, and you know, a lot of our clients have shown a, a lot of interest uh, in this product. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Matt. Welcome, Matt. Um, take it away. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, as Matt said, I'm Matt Geary with Setco. And uh, we at Setco are uh, super excited uh, about this new arrangement that we've come up with uh, to work with AST and their affiliates like NUMAC Legion. Um, I'll, I'll get in at, at the end of the presentation, as Matt alluded to, Mike will be talking about the deployment technology, the equipment, uh, the, the work that we've done thus far in getting this PFAS remediation product in the ground. Uh, but suffice it to say, I want to tell everyone why we're so excited about it. We've started developing, we at Setco started developing this product about uh, coming up on eight years ago now. And from day one, uh, we were working on filtration only, uh, ex situ pump and treat for drinking water and groundwater. And once we started getting the results, some of which I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, every engineering consultant, uh, and end user that I spoke to just about said, hey, can you inject it? And our answer was always, we don't know, we haven't tried. Uh, but then we started talking to AST and their affiliates, and we found out about the BOSS and RPI products and the similarities in sizing anyway between the two. Uh, and we did a trial, and it went well, and here we are. So Mike will take care of the, the installation side as when we get to the end. But I think it makes sense for the, the group that we have here today for me to go over the technical aspects related to the fluorosorb absorbing. You may or may not have heard of fluorosorb, so we'll get into the nitty gritty to introduce it because I think it's important. Doesn't really much matter if you can get something into the ground if it doesn't work. So this is all about how it works and, and why it works. So having said that, I will jump right in. Uh, it does make sense, I think, to give you a very brief background about the parent company of Setco. Uh, the parent company is called Minerals Technology, Inc., a minerals mining company. Uh, and that fact will become germane for you all in just a minute. Uh, MTI is just over $2 billion in revenue, just under 4,000 employees. And we are publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So here's what I hope to cover. Uh, a broad introduction to fluorosorb absorbent. And then we'll go over some uh, university data from McGill University. And that university data is specifically designed to show you the differences between some of the absorbents that are on the market. We'll talk about the absorption mechanism, which makes this product very unique, again, as compared to other uh, in-situ fixants that are available. Then we'll look at some in situ work uh, from the University of and, and some University of Texas at Austin work, university work that was done on in situ, uh, and then a case study for real world in situ remediation that's been done with fluorosorb. That's the point. I'll turn it over to Mike, and then we'll take uh, all the questions that you have. So let's start out with what is fluorosorb. Uh, well, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the parent company is a minerals mining company, and as such, they own a significant portion of the mineral rights to the Wyoming, Wyoming bentonite out in the Black Hills of Wyoming. And Minerals Tech and its predecessors for over 80 years now have been mining that bentonite and turning it into all manner of finished goods. Think of kitty litter, wine filtration, medical uses, you name it. It's the mineral of a thousand uses. Well, Setco, who's a wholly owned subsidiary of Minerals Tech, has had access to that same bentonite for about 25 years. And we've been mining that mineral and modifying it for remedial purposes, to make remedial products. Think of organoclay or organoclay MRM. So what Fluorosorb is, is simply the latest modification that our R&D group came up with this time, though, the modification was specifically designed for the absorption of PFAS molecules. And what you're looking at here in this uh, chart in front of you are the 
some of the grain sizes that we currently manufacture the product in. You can see there the first column is floor absorbed 100. If you go down the column, you see we list physical properties there. There's floor absorbed 200, the next grain size up. Uh, 300 isn't really germane to our conversation today. I'll simply tell you that floor absorbed 400 is the largest grain size we make. Now, we haven't altered this chart yet, but we're about to because when we started working with AST, we, we came up with floor absorb P which is a fully powdered version of the product. I'm sure uh, uh, Michael probably touch on it when we talk about the work we've done thus far, but for injection purposes, we are looking at solely Fluorosorb 100 or the Fluorosorb P version. So some of the features and benefits of Fluorosorb. Uh, one of the ones that we keep hearing feedback on is its versatility and deployment. It can be used for groundwater, or drinking water filtration by itself, pre or post treatment. But I've highlighted the uh, uses of fluorosorb that, again, are related to our conversation today, and that's passive groundwater treatment as in a PRB uh, or source zone treatment or in-situ stabilization. These are two areas where we're very excited. We, we're already working on PRBs that are being constructed in the traditional manner uh, you know, digging a trench with with a backhoe. Uh, however, even those clients are saying, uh, let's get out there and do some injections because we prefer to do it that way. And, and we're going to. Uh, that bullet item under the highlighted ones, sediment capping. Again, I know it's not germane to this group, but I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that we're deploying a lot of a product called reactive core mat which is two needle punch geotextile fabrics that hold in place a known quantity of fluorosorb media. So I don't want to dwell too much on it, just suffice it to say, we've already deployed five large stormwater remediation projects with this product, and we're about to cap a very large pond on a military base. Uh, but uh, focusing on what we're trying to get to today, that lower left-hand quadrant of the screen, it's the real point of the whole the whole talk. It outperforms other products. It's got higher absorption kinetics, better absorption capacity, and very importantly in this application, it has less effect from competitive absorption. And we'll show you some data about that in just, in just a minute. Uh, it is fully commercialized. The lab and field pilot tests are all completed. We are in the field now, uh, and it was formally launched as a product in May of 2019. So as I mentioned, we're going to start with some university data, and this is from McGill University up in Quebec, Canada. And early on, what we had McGill do is uh, in groundwater stimulation, groundwater experiments, compare Fluorosorb 200 to GAC, hardwood biochar, and ion exchange resins. And trying to keep with the theme here of what we're focusing in on today, in situ work via injection, um, GAC works for absorbing uh, PFAS, but as you'll see, not as well as fluorosorb, and there's other issues with co-contaminants. We're going to try and focus in on that. And ion exchange resin from an absorptive capacity works as well as PFAS, excuse me, as fluorosorb. However, uh, there's many more uh, injection issues uh, when you try and, if you were to try and put IX into the ground. So let's look at the results. So when McGill did their testing, we see that for PFOA, PFOS, and total PFOS, fluorosorb significantly outperformed carbon and hardwood biochar and performed similarly to ion exchange resins. But again, for injection, ion exchange resins are really not a candidate. Um, the, the other thing I would point out on this slide before I move to the next is if you take a look at that gray box on the top right, that's a description of the experiments that were done. And those experiments included mixing 40 milligrams of our absorbent into 500 milliliters of Air Force Base contaminated groundwater. And very important to note is that that shaker test was run to a seven day equilibrium. The reason that's important is when we first started sampling this out to various customers, they would come back to us and say, yeah, it did okay. It did a little bit better in carbon, but nothing to write home about, which didn't match our data, and we quickly learned why. The reason for that is because in most shaker tests, they're being run for 48 hours. And because of our unique absorption mechanism that I am going to touch on, 
uh, it's important to run your your test out for, to, to equal equilibrium. And so we went back to all the customers and said, keep the shaker running, take it out to equilibrium. And once they did, they saw the results that you see here, including all the results that I'll share as we go forward. So one of the other important things we wanted to have McGill do, and again, this relates significantly to uh, in situ work, is we wanted to see the effect of co-contaminants. One of the reasons we were asking this, even in the beginning, most of our work was on military sites, and we very rarely had waters that just had PFAS. It usually had other co-contaminants. So what we had McGill do is spike the samples with the co-contaminants you see pictured here to include a very high dosing of naturally occurring organic matter. And they also spiked with diesel 1,4-dioxane, BTEX, and TCE. And except for about a 30% reduction in removal efficiency for PFOA, in the presence of very high naturally occurring organic matter, and about an 18% reduction in removal efficiency for PFOS, again, in the presence of high NOM. You could see that there was virtually no impact of these other co-contaminants on fluorosorb's ability to uptake PFOS. And if I could go back for a second, take a look at uh, PFOA, not in the presence of any co-contaminants. We're looking at about an 89% removal efficiency. Take a look at PFOA in the presence of diesel, this dark gray line. It went up to 96%. Now, we're not implying we're going to be pumping diesel into any of these sites along with our reagent, but it also speaks to this unique absorption mechanism that I will touch on in just a minute. Remember, in the presence of diesel, we actually absorbed more PFOS than not in the presence of diesel. We'll touch on that again later. The last thing from McGill that I wanted to share with you is um, this experiment we had them do with supersaturation. And, and the thought behind it was, we know that we have an immense amount of surface area on our media. So we just wanted to see how much could we possibly load up on it. So we had McGill supersaturate the samples with the four compounds you see listed here and the results were anywhere from 14 milligrams per gram of absorption for PFHXS all the way up to 31 milligrams per gram for PFOS. Now, we are not implying that that's the type of absorptive capacities you're going to get in the field because the supersaturation driver won't be there. Again, this was just us confirming that we have a huge surface area and that it could be taken advantage of. The last thing I'll point out with respect to this slide is if you take a look at these isotherms, this is something we've seen from the very beginning of all of our work. All of the isotherms we do come back with an odd shaped curve. They all have an inflection point. This is, again, something we've seen from the beginning and, and we've had a theory of why that was. And when we get to the absorption mechanism, we'll, we'll tell you what that theory was and how we, how we went ahead and proved it. So the conclusions from McGill were that fluorosorb absorbent is highly effective in removing PFAS from real, real world impacted groundwaters. Uh, and it's superior to GAC and biochar and comparable to ion exchange resin. And it's proven to be effective in mixed waste groundwater conditions. Okay, so I've been hitting at this absorption mechanism and it does make a significant difference. Remember we said that in every study we've done thus far, uh, the isotherm curve looks odd and it has this inflection point. And we had a theory of why that was and we since have gone and proven that theory. And these two images on the bottom here are there to help me explain that. So on the left, what you're looking at is what the floors or platelets look like after we do the modification to our clay. The platelets stack up on top of each other and there's a space in between called the despacing that stays apart due, due to van der Waals and, and many other forces. So what we did is we measured this despacing prior to the inflection point, and then we allowed more PFAS to enter the system and measured it again after the inflection point. And it turned out to be 25 angstroms before this inflection and 50 angstroms after. So what we thought was happening, and we've now proven is happening, is PFAS enters the system, it coats the top, the bottom, and in, in these galleries uh, because of the attractive forces. And then that coating of PFAS 
opens up the galleries such that more PFAS can get in. And then PFAS, and here's the PFAS, which is a known phenomenon due to the attraction between the lipid tail and the head. So we're sort of maximizing the room in the inn, if you will. Remember, we showed that um, in the presence of diesel, we actually absorbed more PFAS. This is likely due to the same phenomenon. Diesel, a fairly large molecule, gets into these galleries and again, opens up the uh, platelets to allow for more absorption. So let's move on to uh, some of the university work that we did that's most germane to what we're trying to do or what we're going to be doing with AST and hopefully with some of you on the phone. Uh, we started our research on in-situ soil work at the University of Texas at Austin. However, before we go to the University of Texas at Austin, we have to go to Australia because where Florizorb was first looked at, ironically, was in uh, Australia with a company called Arcadis and a man named Peter Storch who had a uh, Australian DOD contract. And one of the tasks was to start looking at in situ stabilization for PFAS on DOD sites. It makes sense, right? Because if you can stabilize and not build very expensive pump and treat systems that run forever, you know, it's a win win. So what they did is they gave a soil sample to Mr. Storch and he ran some experiments and this gray box in the middle uh, is, is a summarization of that experiment. So if you take a look at his first control on that soil, he leached the soil without any treatment. And we could see that the PFAS that leached out was at 228 parts per million. So this was some super high contaminated soil. His second control was cement alone. Uh, and one of the reasons why he wanted to look at cement alone is because his marching orders, if you will, were to achieve a high unconfined compressive strength in case they find a site that they uh, want to do in situ stabilization and then redevelop afterwards. Uh, and in addition to that, cement can uh, reduce the hydraulic conductivity through your monolith when you're stabilizing, further reducing leaching. But either way, he added cement by itself, and we see that leaching dropped to 1.17. Then he went out and got two commercially available fixins. The first was an aluminum hydroxide carbon blend, and he mixed that in, and leaching dropped to 0.75 ppm. But then when the aluminum hydroxide carbon blend and cement were mixed together, leaching went up to 245 ppm. So at that point, it leached higher than the control with no treatment. And this is possibly due to the increase in pH created by the addition of the Portland cement. So he pressed on and he got fluorosorb and he mixed that in and leaching dropped to 0 0.30. And lastly, fluorosorb with cement, leaching dropped down to 0 0.04. So the fluorosorb and cement was clearly the best admixture, but probably equally as important, he showed that the addition of cement had no deleterious effect on fluorosorb's ability to uptake the PFAS. So he took this data and he shared it with his U.S. colleagues who repeated this bench testing for a U.S. DOD site. And then in 2018, they purchased 40,000 pounds of fluorosorb to go and do a large field pilot. In that field pilot, they ended up putting in 5% fluorosorb and 10% Portland cement, which three or four years later now uh, seems like a, a, a much higher amount than was needed. Um, but it was kind of a fail-safe early experiment. So when they put in the 5 and 10, uh, they were able to get leaching down below the levels they were aiming for. And what's interesting, though, is they went back every quarter for three years and took another core just to ensure that the leaching wasn't, you weren't getting desorption and the leaching wasn't ticking up. And it turns out that that was not the case. But because they were going back for three years and taking these samples, we had no additional data on the site, and Arcadis could not share it with us because they were getting ready to write a paper, which has since been written, and it's published and available. It's called Omega, and, and you could find it. Um, but having said that, we found ourselves, SETCO, in a position of, well, we don't have any data. This is good information, but we don't have any data. So that's what took us to the University of Texas at Austin. We sent them some DOD soil. We had them analyze it. Uh, because it was DOD and it was 2018, uh, the action level uh, was the health advisory level of 70 PPT. 
So you can see that there were many PFAS uh, molecules that were above that 70 PPT. And then uh, the professor took that soil and uh, did a lot of things. In fact, when the professor gives this presentation, it's about 40 minutes between that slide I just showed you and this one. But for purposes of time, I'm jumping to the end slide that shows the results uh, of their work. And what we're looking at here on the left is the concentration of PFAS uh, in the leachate after various treatments. On the bottom from left to right, you're looking at in increasing addition of Portland cement. So if you look at the control, the top gray line, that's with zero fluorosorb, we see that there was a reduction in leaching of PFAS uh, with the addition of cement from three to 5%. But once you got past 5% cement, you can see that it quickly starts to rise, the, the, the amount of PFAS in the leachate, so much so that, and not pictured here, but after 10% cement, it quickly became asymptotic and all the PFAS came rushing out. Again, likely a pH effect. So then we move to the yellow line, a low dose fluorosorb, 1%. And we could see that with 5% fluorosorb, excuse me, 5% Portland and 1% fluorosorb, they did get one uh, mark below the target value. Uh, in speaking to the professor, he'd said, oh, that's a shame. Uh, and, and my answer was no, because you could find yourself with a site that doesn't have a high unconfined compressive strength where you need very little or no cement. And in fact, the work we're, most of the work we're doing now has no cement. Uh, but th the point is, on, in those types of situations, we show, it shows you that very low dosing of fluorosorb could do the trick. Uh, but lastly, when you need high unconfined compressive strength, they pressed on and they went to a 5% dosing of fluorosorb, and we could see that uh, they called the optimal blend 5% fluorosorb and 5% Portland cement. But what's interesting is once you got the 5% fluorosorb, even as you kept adding cement, it never ticked up above that action level. So that's good for a site where you may be building a high rise and need a very high unconfined compressive strength. So the university concluded that all PFAS were reduced to low concentrations for all mixed designs containing fluorosorb 100. By the way, 100 was the grain size they used here. And that was regardless of cement content. Uh, cement alone was not effective in stabilizing these same constituents. And the university concluded that the, the mix that was five and five was the optimal mix. I, I would contend that there's really no such thing as an optimal mix because you're gonna look at the particulars of any given site and. And, and make those kind of decisions. So the last thing I'll talk about uh, is, so that was lab work that was done. Then we took it to the field. Uh, this was an interesting case study uh, for a Canadian Defense Department site. What happened is that Canadian Defense Department site sent out an RFP and the RFP simply said, excavate, transport, and incinerate 70,000 cubic meters of PFAS contaminated soil. Well, that was done. Of course, SECO didn't bid on that because we don't do incineration. Uh, and when the prices came in, I think they were pretty high. So they looked at a new strategy where they would pick a cutoff point of concentration under which let's try and see if we can stabilize it. And that's what they did. And that was approximately 30,000 cubic meters were under that line where they were going to try and stabilize. So in order to do that, stabilizing of the soil that was from a former firefighting training area, they had a treatability study conducted, um, a, a bench scale study, where they went out and got a, two different fixants and they mixed it in different ratios and then did uh, the leaf method uh, uh, leaching test to determine uh, which was getting the best results. And this is part of the lab study results from that uh, institute from that stabilization project. And you could see that 1% fluorosorb removed 99% PFAS, 92% PFHXA, et cetera, uh, and 2% did a little better. Now, it's interesting what actually happened on this job, and I'll tell you in a, in a minute, uh, but clearly the 1% and 2% dosing of fluorosorb were sufficient to get them to the reduction in leaching that they required. Here is the comparison between uh, the, the fluorosorb and the other product that was being um, uh, tested on this particular site. And you could see this is what each of them did at 1%. And just for 
it shows you the difference between each of the different PFAS molecules, but the summarization is here. Average for all PFAS was 92.7% for fluorosorb and 67.8% uh, for the other fixing. And again, they use the LEAF method uh, to, as, their, as their standard of, of testing um, and determined or concluded that one or 2% of fluorosorb would be sufficient based on this. With untreated, they were still reaching 73% of the PFAS. With 1% fluorosorb, it dropped to 6.51. And with a 2% dosing of fluorosorb, it dropped to 6.28. So what was interesting, they wrote a bid spec that said you can use 1% fluorosorb or 4% of that other product. And, if, and people bid it, and the project was won at 1%. But the contractor quite rightly went to, once they won the job, went to the government and said, you know, it's very difficult to mix 1% of anything homogeneously over 30,000 cubic meters. We think you should go with 2%, even though the lab study showed you don't need 2%. And the, the government agreed and 2% uh, ended up being installed. So I'm going to wrap up here by simply telling you that uh, I'll mention again, this product is fully commercialized. We could make as much as needed, uh, you know, with enough lead time, um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's manufactured in our ISO 9001 certified facility in the U.S. And this is, and this is recorded and we can get you copies. I don't expect anyone to be writing down or trying to figure out what this is. I just want you to know that here are just a sample of the publications related to fluorosorb in journals and academic papers and soil stabilization papers. That first one by McDonough, at, um, uh, who was with Arcadis at the time, that's called ACS Omega. That's the one that I referred to uh, in, in my slide presentation. With that, I will turn it over to Mike. And at the end, uh, we're going to be asking questions. I, I believe there's a chat where questions could be placed. So I will stop sharing and uh, uh, get ready to listen to Mike. Thank you, Matt. Let me... Matt, just stay unmuted for a second. Make sure you can see that. I can. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, this is Mike Mazaris. Is, um uh, Matt Hansen had um, mentioned in his introduction. And so I'm going to talk about the application portion for, for a few minutes and actually talk about another Canadian site um, where this product was used in a, in a funnel and gate PRB application. Uh, it was not injected, but would be a a nice surrogate for um, you know looking at the potential for this technology in a uh, PRB scenario. So Matt mentioned the questions. <clears throat> you can go ahead and kind of filter those in, and I'll I'll take about 10, 15 minutes here to get through this section, and then we'll go ahead and just open it up, um, and we'll bring both Matt's on, and uh, and then uh, get you guys um, back to work here in about 25 minutes. So. So as Matt had mentioned, um, we, we really specialize in slurry applications and we've been, we've been injecting slurries ourselves for about close to 20 years. And as Matt Hansen had mentioned, we um, have worked with uh, Numac slash Legion for the last several years and have done uh, a number of injections of uh, primarily activated carbon-based technologies, mainly BOS 200 from RPI. And what the nice thing is, is when we started, and I'll show you some pictures from the field demonstration that we did about six months ago, it's the same equipment and there were no modifications that were, that were needed. So, so how do we get this material on the ground? You know, Matt showed, you know, an in situ mixing application i'll i'll show you another application here in a few minutes at the end where they created treatment cells they were able to excavate those in so that could only really be economically applied in certain situations and you know maybe logistically you can't trench it in or soil mix 
And that's really where injection come in. And that's really for all, for all applications, you know, of really any, any injectate, right. And for any contaminant of concern. And so the bulk of the injections that we see will be, you know, utilizing direct push. And that's the bulk of our slurry injections, regardless if it's a, an activated carbon or if it's a, uh, or if it's, or if it's fluorosorb. And, you know, working for 20 years, we work all over the U.S. and Europe and Australia and uh, other places. You know, obviously we're working in different different geologies, and so everything from you know finer grain units, clay silts, up to sands and gravels. You know, so we have to play with um, certain variables like flow rate, pressure, volume. Uh, actually, the injection tip itself, that's downhole, can actually change to we can in we can modify the exit velocity of our slurries coming out of the injection tips by using different injection uh, tip geometries. And so, you know, we can, and I'll kind of show you what an injection pattern looks like in from an aerial view, but here's what the cross section looks like uh, there on the right. And so we're injecting in um, lenses that are usually about a half a meter apart. And then we stagger those uh, st stagger those layers between adjacent points and design the injection volume such that that we get some that we get some overlap. Um, so that's kind of a standard application I'm sure most people are going to be familiar with. Uh, but one issue that we've run into here in the U.S. we've run into in Australia as well is that not all sites are going to be direct push friendly, and so we have developed what we call a pre-drill technique, which is essentially using traditional drilling methods like sonic or augers uh, to uh, bypass and drill through whatever that refusal zone is. Let's just say it's weathered rock. And we backfill that with hydrated bentonite, let it set up for a day or two, and then we can come back down through there with direct push. And uh, a, a number of our applications for activated carbon have used this approach in Australia. And I could see th this approach being used for fluorosorb as well. And we've completed about 50 sites combined between US, Canada, and Australia. And then lastly, um, bedrock. So when you actually in fracture bedrock and consolidated rock, you can't use either of those aforementioned techniques. And so we're using straddle packers and um, actually, oh, sorry, there we go. So I did forget to mention, show this. So this is actually Legion's injection unit. And actually you'll see ours uh, here in a few slides when we did our field demo in the States uh, last year. And, the, and it looks very similar actually. Um, and here's a shot of the packers that we use there on the, there on the left. So we're inflating those in an open rock hole and isolating a fracture and pumping the uh, pumping the slurry into that into that fracture, and and, we, and one comment there: we have not used uh, packers in Australia yet. We have uh, evaluated a couple a couple applications. We have not used, but we have used, as I mentioned, a regular traditional direct push as well as as well as pre drill. So from a so from an aerial standpoint, you know, typically, so whether it's a grid or whether it's a PRB, and I'll kind of talk about both of those, we use what we call a triangular grid pattern, which is really just offsetting your injection points between your um, adjacent rows. Okay, and that has given us better distribution, and you kind of have a you have a better um, you're you're less likely to have any sort of bypass come down, have your groundwater bypass the reagent. The spacing between those injection points is going to be a function of your starting depth and your geology. You know, starting depth is going to um, probably weigh into that a little heavier. So if you're starting at, say, one and a half, two meters, you're going to be on a relatively tight spacing, um, probably on one and a half, maybe two meters between your injection points. But as the deeper the application gets, we can start to expand that to three or maybe even greater than, slightly greater than three meters. So I, I, I see a lot of our applications um, being reactive barrier walls. 
And just because of the size of these sites, the relative low concentrations. Um, so um, we'll have some source uh, some source applications like Matt had shown more IS, more maybe more on the ISS end. But I see a lot of our injection applications being permeable reactive barriers. And so ideally, again, we could trench this material in. And if you have the space to do it, you have a shallow groundwater table, um, this is the best approach for any for any technology because you'll never get better distribution than this. And what's really important is so this is a this is a site in the states that I worked on. This was this is a chlorinated site, but we're mixing reactive media with sand in a kind of silt claystone, shallow silt claystone that was right below the surface there. That what you see, and you you create this you create a sump essentially where you have really high resonance time, which is really important when you have an adsorbent, when you when you need that, when you need that contact time, right? When you're dealing with these really low concentrations. But again, we can't use that approach all the time. And so when we do have to inject it, you know, what's that look like? And so we have to put enough material in that cross section and get it distributed properly. It's never going to be when you're injecting slurries or really probably any reagent put that in one row of injection points because you're going to ultimately have gaps. And so what we've had success in using for petroleum hydrocarbon and chlorinated sites with other slurries is starting off with three or four rows. The example here shows four rows on relatively tight spacing. So one and a half, two meter spacing. And, um, and, it, it obviously the mass flux, you know, calculations are going to give us a handle on how much we have to put in that cross section. All reagents that are all solids have a slurry density that we have to consider when we get into the field. So you, you know, three or four is probably going to be kind of a sweet spot for most of these applications, but depending on the mass flux coming through your cross section and what the goals are and what kind of safety factors that you want to apply, you may, you may have additional rows. So here are just some quick photos from the demonstration that we did uh, about six months ago. So this was at our headquarters, which is outside of Lexington, Kentucky. And so you see there on the left, there's our geoprobe uh, advancing in an injection point getting set up. On the right is uh, one of our mobile injection units. So I, I mentioned it, you know, looks very similar to the setup that Legion has. And so you see us uh, batching up batching up the floor absorb. So we demonstrated the injection of both uh, floor absorb P and the, and the 100 that Matt had mentioned. And so here's, there's the floor absorb in our, in our, in, in our batch tank. So the, the mixing systems are, are equally as important as, as the pumps and all the other equipment, because you've got to be able, there's no guar or anything that's mixed in with uh, floor absorb to be able to keep it in suspension. And so we have to have enough energy in our in our mixed tank and have it properly designed with baffling to be able to keep this material in suspension. And so you see there on the right hand side, um, that's just what that what that what that slurry looks like. So you can see it's relatively relatively small um, particles that are ultimately being injected into the subsurface. And then once you once you do stop that energy, it does, you can see it's starting to separate out there once the injection energy is taken away. But it does, if you kick that mixer back on, it's gonna, it is gonna, it is gonna resuspend. And I guess one thing that's really important to mention is that you know, Matt had mentioned sort of the base for all of this uh, is clay, but when it's modified, it doesn't it's not a clay anymore. And that's part of their uh, part of the work that they do on their end is that obviously we don't want to inject something that's going to swell on the subsurface and potentially impact the hydraulic conductivity. Super critical, right? When we're talking about when we're, we're talking about reactive barrier walls, we don't want to have our groundwater flow around or below or above our reactive barrier wall. And so you can see here we've we've had jars like this sitting on our sitting in our laboratory uh, for months now, and there's there's no there's no there's no swelling. So that's an, uh, something important to mention. So 
We're, um, I'll take a few more minutes here to discuss the site that was completed in Canada at a, at a military base where Florizorb, as you'll see there, you, the, better, the better image is the one on the right. They looked at three different dosages. So this was applied um, with sand, so two and a half, five and seven and a half percent by weight Florizorb, uh, followed by uh, a granular activated carbon polish. And then <clears throat> without uh, MSE or uh, mechanically stabilized earth on both, on both sides of that. And the groundwater is flowing from the top of the page down to the bottom. And the setup they have here, and you know, one of the, the nice things about a PRB is you have really, you can, from a monitoring standpoint, you, know, you have a series of injection of monitoring wells, up gradient, several down gradient, so you can easily see, or you can put them within the reactive media too, to be able to kind of track the contaminant reductions as they pass through. And I'll show you that data here in a minute. And so they have uh, three different zones that they identified. They have an influx zone, uh, the reactive zone where the floor absorb was, and also the also the discharge zone. <clears throat> and you can see here, uh, this is the sum. So this is your this is your total PFAS, where you've got your up gradient and down gradient wells. And so obviously there's mass on the down gradient side of this before the PRB was installed. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, the goal being obviously that that's going to, that that's going to reduce over time. But what we can show is that what the concentrations are doing within this, within this, within this PRB cross section, within the gate portion of, of the funnel and gate. And so we see 26.1 micrograms per liter uh, drop down to 0.05 within that, within that reactive zone. And if you look off to the right, you can see the breakdown of an MC is modified clay. So that's what that's the that's the floor absorb again. And so you can see the um, uh, the data from the from the various reactive cells for the first three months and then and then the next three months. And so you see that the removal efficiency was pretty high initially for the five and the seven and a half, but by the time you got to that 90 day period, um, the two and a half had caught up as well. And so, you know, from the data that Matt had shown and from um, from this data, you know, granted it's only it's only six months, you know, probably that, you know, one to three to four percent. I'll I'll let kind of Matt chime in on that whenever we get to the QA here is sort of maybe kind of a, a good kind of uh, spot for us to or a, a good place to start the conversation of you know how much material are you going to need to put in the cross section to be able to adsorb these contaminants um, efficiently. So all right well um, thank you everyone for your uh, for your for your time today. We know everyone's got busy schedules and um, so I guess Matt and Matt, if you guys want to unmute yourselves, we can open up the Q and A. Okay, I cannot put my video back on. That's probably a good thing for everybody. <laughs> um, um, should we dive into the questions here and just we'll see which are for you, which are for me, or both of us? Sure. Yeah, the questions we have so far are certainly not for me. So, uh, okay. <laughs> well, it looks like Ben K writes, uh, in addition to GAC biochar IX resin, uh, have you also have data for comparison against other powdered activated carbon products available in the market, both for injection and soil stabilization applications? Now, I don't have any, and the universities haven't done any of those things. Um, in the, the project that Mike just showed, there was, it was compared to carbon. I, I don't know if it was powdered or what the other carbon was, but I we can get that data and get it to you. Uh, uh, so the next question was from Anonymous. Uh, in the reference studies uh, against or with GAC, what was the iodine number of the GAC that we used? I, I don't know that, but I can tell you what GAC it was. It was, uh, 
F400, uh, which is uh, the most, at least in the US, the most commonly specified for uh, PFAS. Uh, and on the, the next question from Darren was, um, what was happening between discharge and down gradient? Why did it increase? Um, does that mean like the last slide that you had? Yeah, I think it's it's referring to it's referring to this slide, and I'm not sure if that's because if you look at where the monitoring wells are, if they're being influenced by the native material, that's kind of what I would assume. Is that yeah. is that is that down here in this discharge end? Um, these three wells are being influenced by the untreated groundwater that's on that that that's on the down gradient side. You're getting some of that back diffusion into um, into the. I'm assuming that that's that's the question. Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. And and to your prompt there, Mike, um, about dosing, mm -hmm. uh, the way that works is. Um, we would get, we would ask for the concentrations and groundwater flow. Um, and we have models built that can give you a breakthrough analysis. So uh, I'll give you a case in point. We're working on a, a PRV for a Superfund site, and this is the highest dosing we've ever recommended thus far. Um, the, they gave us all of the PFAS uh, concentrations, and they said that they wanted uh, us to give them a dosing that would give them again they're using that set they were using that 70 ppt combine less than 70 ppt for 20 years so we did our calculator and we shot back that we need to do six percent by weight but what that six percent by weight is giving them is less than two nanograms per liter for 40 years so I'm not sure exactly why our tech group over-designed it that way, but the point I'm trying to make is that's the highest dosing I've seen to date in all of our calculations, 6%. Mm -hmm. we, we already went over the, the job in Canada where one in the lab, 1% work, but they actually put 2% in. So it's, it's all going to be contingent on concentrations and groundwater flow, but we really believe that anywhere from two to 4% for most sites by weight uh, for most sites is going to be sufficient. Uh, it's also going to depend on what your discharge parameters are, but that's the range of where we think we're going to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, Matt, if you look at the very bottom, there is, there is uh, more question that's come in. That would be, that would be for you. Okay. <laughs> yes, we are excited about the Biden Harris administration uh, PFAS roadmap. <laughs> uh, how would the use of the product in seepage recovery pumps from an ash dam fit into the plant into plant closure? What is the long term viability over several years? Um, seepage recovery pumps. A, if if what you're referring to, and I, I may be at, over my skis a little bit here, though, but uh, just any type of gravity filter, uh, that's it's being deployed right now in gravity filters and wastewater treatment plants. So I I I can't see why that wouldn't work. And the long term viability over several years is is interesting, right? Um, like I said in that uh, U.S. Superfund site example. Uh, we have gave a predictive model that we could give them 40 years at less than two nanograms per liter. And again, that was all based on uh, all of the data we have for all of the PFAS. Uh, we, we have established absorption capacities for 40 different PFAS on our product. And this is after eight years of collecting data. Um, so we can tell you the 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 the, lon the longevity now if someone were you know if you if you had a site where we know that our product can absorb this much and and we're just giving you math right if whatever there's an acid spill or or something changes the geochemistry 
maybe that would change our long-term uh, viability. But we know that it's a very strong bond. And, and once in those galleries that I showed you, once PFAS gets into those galleries, it is a tortuous past, path to get out. And all I could say is comparing it to carbon, we know that carbon works for PFAS, but carbon works for everything. And therein lies the problem. You can, it will absorb PFAS, but then absorb the next thing that goes along. So it's highly likely that your desorption is going to be higher with a carbon-based amendment as compared to the fluorosorb amendment. I hesitate to put, because I hear this all the time, how long will it last? Well, the regulated community is going to have to make a decision as to what they want to use as a litmus litmus test for how long it'll last. What I mean by that is we have, and so have many of the engineers we've been working with, we've been using the LEAF method to determine the applicability of fluorosorb for a long-term solution. Uh, but I think it's still an open question as to what ultimately will be the litmus test for, for what's acceptable uh, to, to, um, you know, to, to make those kind of liability decisions. So Matt, there's one more that popped up there at the end. How often is it required to re-inject or replace in a trench? Yeah, it's really going to depend on the design, right? As to you know what what the what the design life is. So you've got you know, your certain mass flux coming through your cross section, and based on um, the particular PFAS compounds that are coming through and what the goals are, then Matt's Matt's company is going to provide a and, and what that design life is. Um, so that's going to be one of the going to be one of the inputs in the in the in the design. So yeah, that would be part of our deliverables a mm -hmm. a, uh, a a projection of lifespan. Uh, and then you know when you're writing the action remedial action work plan, it's you know we, we we've got a model that's telling us forty years uh, and. If we get breakthrough after 40 years, we'll go down gradient and do it again for another 40 years. Hmm. Um, and then there was another one. Uh, once injected with the fluorosorb particles stay in place in the soil profile like BOS or tend to migrate. Well, we, we believe it's not going to migrate. And that was one of the, uh, the features and benefits and why we wanted to get working on injection here. It has very similar physical properties to BOS. So we don't anticipate that it will move. No, I would I would agree with that. I mean, that's kind of the goal of a of a PRB <laughs> is to is to keep it is to keep it in place. And so, you know, to go back to one of the other questions about um, you know small size activated carbon, you know that that can be a problem for a PRB is that it can be mobile. And so. Um, I think based on the particle size and based on our experience injecting slurries and working on a lot of reactive barrier walls, uh, can safely say that the material will be staying in place. I mean, the the extreme example would be if is if you're in a is if you're in a gravel bed, but that's not that's a pretty atypical application for us. So. Well, I, I think we're up against it on time. And so everyone that everyone that attended today, uh, we'll go ahead and send you a follow-up email here in the next couple of days. Um, this was this was recorded. And we're also open to giving this presentation one-on-one -on -one or within your within your company. So please, you know, I'll have uh, my contact information and and uh, both the mats. And so and we'll you know provide some. Uh, guidance to to you as to sort of you know who your point of contact will be, and um, and yeah, we're more than happy to uh, sit and answer more questions, uh, or again give this presentation, or maybe give it a more uh, expanded version of it. So before uh, you go, Mike, before yes. we finish, I actually have one last question, which is logistically, how how soon would the product be available in Australia? Uh, there is an amount, I don't know what it is, on the water now. Okay. Thank you. That's all I need to know. And thanks again to everyone from, from Legion's perspective as well. And yeah, every, I mean, most of you here would have my contact details already. 
if there's if you ever want to set up a meeting with myself and Matt or Mike, you know, again, contact me anytime. And um, I guess we'll also be on the lookout for potential pilot trial applications as well. So if anyone's got a project that they'd be interested in in working with us on as as a demonstration, we'd be certainly keen to talk about that as well. And thanks to Matt and, and Mike for yeah. putting this together. Thank Very you, cool. everyone. Yep, Enjoy thank you. Evening. Take care. Thank you. No, well, good afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean good afternoon. Anyway, where you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone.